I didn't know I would have that long of walk-up music. <laughs> so, in case you didn't know, I'm not Mark. I'm Chris. I'm the discipleship minister here, and I am thrilled to get to spend some time with you this morning talking about the book of James. Um, we're in the third week of our series on, on James, and it's called Growing Up with Jesus because, well, James is Jesus' half-brother, and he literally grew up with Jesus. He walked in his footsteps from the time he was able to walk. In fact, I would guess that James probably wore Jesus' hand-me-down sandals. He literally walked in Jesus' shoes. So he has this unique perspective on what a life of following Jesus looks like. Okay, now I need you to put on your honest hats. We're in church Okay, show of hands, how many of you had a sibling who was the golden child, right? Who got everything right, got all the good grades. Keep your hands up, because I, I, there's a point, right? So, I'm not trying to stir anything up here, but those of you who have your hand up, look around. The ones who don't have their hand up, they were the golden child. Now you know. That's how, James, that's how James felt, right? That's how James felt. So you can see, I mean, when you grow up in the shadow of Jesus, it's like, I, I can understand why he would be hesitant to think that Jesus was the Messiah. And, and in John chapter 7, it tells us that none of Jesus' brothers thought he was the Messiah. But then we have this this moment in time where everything changes. Everything changes. And Paul talks about it in 1 Corinthians 15. He, he says that Jesus, after the resurrection, right, appeared to hundreds of people. And one of those people was James, his half-brother. And from that point forward, everything for James changed. That was his aha moment, right? He realizes, hey, he is the Messiah. I did grow up walking in the footsteps of the Messiah. That's incredible. And so he believes and he becomes a new creation. And, and he wants to tell everybody about it. Because his life has changed, he wants to share so that other people's lives will be changed too. So he writes this letter. And he writes this letter to other believers who have been scattered around the world. And he starts his letter just by identifying who he is. Now, if I were Jesus' brother and I was writing a letter to you all, I would start with, hey, I'm Jesus' brother. That's not what James does. He doesn't say, hey, I'm Jesus' brother. He doesn't say, hey, I'm a leader of the church. James says, I am a willing servant of Jesus. That's how James introduces himself. That's his identity. And Mark talked about that in week one. And then last week, we talked about James's advice for going through adversity, difficulty in the midst of trial. And he says, hey, you know what? We should have joy in the midst of a trial because we know that God is doing something. He's working. He is hard at work in us, bringing us to maturity, to who he wants us to be. So during the trial, we develop perseverance, but, but the goal isn't to endure. The goal is to become more like Jesus, more spiritually mature. We can have joy because God's leading us where he wants us to be. So James goes on and he just teaches throughout his letter, he teaches us that our faith has implications in our lives. It produces different outcomes. So we become servants just like he addresses himself. We're willing to subject our will to his will. We develop this desire to grow. 
and in the midst of that growth, there's joy. And this week, we're going to see what else James has to say about how faith changes us. Now, Mark said last week that the past couple years have been hard. I agree. The past couple years have been trying. That's probably a good word. COVID has made things difficult. There's so much unpredictability. There, a, a, a couple years back, there's this really contentious election, right? Lots of tension. There's racial tension that's happening. It, everything is uncertain. Everything feels like we're just ready to explode, right? Because we just, we just don't know, okay, what's next? What's next? And honestly, this last week has been a microcosm of the past two years. I mean, just think about it. the last week. Gas prices have gone up again. We don't know what they're going to look like in a couple of weeks. Interest rates have gone up again. We don't know what they're going to look like in a couple of weeks. Lots of uncertainty, right? And then there's this leaked memo about a Supreme Court decision that might overturn Roe versus Wade. And all of a sudden, there's political unrest all over the place on both sides. And so there's this tension that exists. And I don't know about you, but if you look around, if you look, if you look on Facebook, I'm guessing you're not going to say that what would describe us in the midst of our tension is joy. Uh-uh. I think it's more like hostility. I mean, it's hostility, and that's not just people who aren't believers. That's believers, too. It's like we've got this so much anger and frustration built up that we're just hostile. Now, here's what's cool. I'm pretty sure, in fact, I know this is true, James wrote the first ever Christian guide to social media 2,000 years ago. It's true. So we're going to be in James chapter 1, and we're going to start with verse 19. This is a verse I taught my kids, right? This is a, a verse that I tried to impress upon them greatly. I think James is doing the same for us. Chapter 1, verse 19, my dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry, because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent and humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. Now, James, the passage before, ends with him saying that God has given us every good and perfect gift. Why? So that, so that we could be his first fruits, so that our lives would be evidence of him living in us. James says we should listen intently first, that we should that we should take some time before we spout off, right? That we should not get angry, but we should remain calm. Why? So that our lives show the evidence of God in us. Our fruit looks like Jesus. Now, I had a conversation with Chad just to make sure I was on the right page, but how do you tell what kind of tree you have in your yard? By the fruit, right? If I say I have an apple tree, what is it going to produce? Apples, absolutely. If I have an oak tree, what's it going to produce? Acorns. If I have a maple tree, what's it going to produce? Pancakes. No. <laughs> maple syrup is what it's going to produce, right? So we know 
Now, if, an, if, if, if your neighbor said, hey, I have an apple tree and it's producing pears, what does he have? A pear tree, right? What does a Jesus tree produce? A life that looks like Jesus, right? A life that looks like Jesus. That's exactly what James is saying here. He's saying, hey, look, if you're going to do, if you're, if you're going to have faith, if you're going to follow Jesus, then your life better bear fruit that looks like Jesus. This is the way Jesus acted. He was, he was quick to listen. He was slow to speak and he was slow to become angry. Pretty simple, right? Have you, have you ever said anything in anger that you wish you could take back? I have never. <laughs> never. Today. Um, God, you know, I, I had a boss tell me this once. God equipped you with two ears and one mouth for a reason. You should use your ears twice as often. Um, how much better would the world be? If James 1.9 was, was the rule? How much better would social media be if James 1.19 was the rule we all follow? How about your workplace? How about your home? We kind of let our anger go at home sometimes, don't we? How much better would the world be if we just, I mean, simple instructions, right? Listen first. Be slow to speak, slow to become angry. All right, I'm not going to dwell there because James has a lot to say in his letter about things that you should and shouldn't say and the way you should and shouldn't say them. And we're going to talk about that a little bit down the road. So I'm going to move on. So the transition that James uses here, um, he says in verse 21 that we should purge all the junk from the world and replace it with the word, right? He says we should let the word of God take root in our lives. So let's pick up with verse 22. He says, don't merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do it uh, is like someone who uh, looks at his face in a mirror and upon looking at himself, goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they've heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. Now, this is one of those times that that I feel like words are, are, I mean, words are always meaningful, but this is just one of those times where you know, translations are different. The NASB uses the word hearers of the word. And the NIV uses the word listener or listen to the word. I don't know about you, but I feel like there's a difference between hearing and listening. Hearing is like a physical response to, to the stimuli of sound, right? Listening is, is more of an intentional action. So, when we lived in Maryland, we had a four-story townhouse, and Eli had, uh, had a game room, TV room on the first floor, which happened to be the floor where the main entrance was. My office was on the fourth floor, and so the doorbell would ring. I can't tell you for certain whether or not he heard the doorbell, but I know he didn't listen to it. Right? He didn't respond. He didn't respond. And now, if I could hear it, he probably could too. But if I, before I went upstairs, said to him, Hey, hey bud, could you do me a favor? I'm going to be all the way up on the fourth floor. Could, could you just listen for the doorbell? And I don't have to say anything else. I don't have to tell him to answer the door because there's an expectation there. That, that he's going to be actively listening, actively, intentionally waiting for that doorbell to ring and he will respond. That's what I think James means here. 
We could just be people who hear the word, but he says we should be people who listen to the word intently, actively. Now, the question is, we can sit and listen to the word all day, but what are we doing with it? What are we doing with it? Are, is it changing our lives? Are we applying it to, our, to how we live day by day? And if we're not doing that, what's the point? I'm, I'm telling you, we need to be active, intentional about letting the word grow in us develop us. Now, James is coming from the perspective of a Jewish family. He grew up in a Jewish household, and every day, twice a day, they would recite the Shema, right? The Shema is just is Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9. Here's what it says. It says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them upon your children. Talk about them when you sit at home, when you walk along the road, when you lie down, when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands. Bind them to your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and your gates. Why do you suppose God gave them this passage? Why do you suppose they said it twice a day? Was it just to show they could memorize a few verses? No. He gave it to them so they would remember who he is, what he has done for them, and how they should live because of that. That's the house that James grew up in. That's the importance of the word in James's house. And that's the importance of the word in your house and in my house. That's exactly the way we should live. Now, parents, what happens when you ask your kid to do something or act a certain way and they don't? Not good things, right? Okay, a little more difficult question. Moms, you're exempt just today. What happens when your words don't match what you're telling them to do? Or when your actions don't match what you're telling them to do? Ooh. Well, once they get old enough to see that, your words become empty, meaningless, hollow. They don't hold weight. God gave the people of Israel a Shema so that they would remember who he is. And his word is never meaningless. It's never hollow. It's never empty. It's always true. And that's what he wants our word to be. That's what he wants our life to be, is one that reflects the truth of who God is. One that reflects the love that he has shown us. Our life is meaningful when it's a response to what Jesus has done for us. Our faith is meaningful when we're responding to him. That's the foundation that James lays for chapter 2. He says, he says basically this. A life of faith is going to look different. It's going to look different. And here's one way it's going to look different. In a life of faith, we don't play favorites. James 2, 1 says, My brothers and sisters, believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ, must not show favoritism. Now, over the next few verses, James speaks specifically, he, he speaks specifically about the poor, Right? But really, I think that's just one example. I think James, just like he knew with social media, he knew what our culture would look like because his culture looked like it too. We are really good at categorizing people. 
we categorize people by, by what they look like, by what they wear, by where they live, by how they talk. We, we have all kinds of ways that we categorize people, right? And we also have lots of ways that we put people on pedestals. And we say, this person is more important, I will act differently towards them. And we have ways of looking down our noses at people and saying, I'm better than you, and I will treat you differently than everyone else. James says, that is completely out of line with who Jesus is and who Jesus calls us to be. Jesus, uh, James says, hey, we should, we should treat everybody the same because we're all the same. We're all sinners. We're all in need of mercy. We're all in need of grace. And Jesus gives it. Not just to a handful of people. Jesus gives it to everyone. And so should we. Verses 12 and 13, James says, Speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom, because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Jesus says, James says, and Jesus says, that there is no room for judgment. There is room for mercy. Mercy is greater. Mercy is greater. Now, if that sounds familiar, what James is saying, it's because we have seen it before from Jesus in Matthew chapter 9. Right? Jesus, so Jesus does things that nobody else does, right? He doesn't put people on pedestals. He doesn't look down his nose at people. He eats with tax collectors and sinners. And the Pharisees, who do look down their noses at people, they, they come and they complain to his followers and say, why is he eating with tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus hears, in verse 12, he says, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. And then he says to the Pharisees this, he says, go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. If Jesus loves us enough to offer us mercy and grace, shouldn't we offer that same thing to other people? I mean, if he loves us that much, shouldn't we, shouldn't, if we're, if we're living a life that reflects Jesus, shouldn't we offer that same mercy and grace to others? A life of faith will look different than a life without it. Verse 14, James 2, 14. James goes on, he says, What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such a faith save them? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, Go in peace, keep warm and well fed but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if not accompanied by action, is dead. Now, James might be a little bit over the top with some of his examples. I mean, can you imagine passing someone in this room, right, and, you know, they're cold and they don't have shelter and they're hungry and saying to them, you know, you should really find a place to sit and eat. Have a nice day. Would you do that? Of course not. No. We would never do that. But really, we're just not crass enough to say it. We will ignore them. If I can't see them, I don't know that the problem exists. That's not how James says we should act. Not, not in the least. 
So do you ignore your brothers and sisters in need? James says that the faithful who don't act in accordance with their faith, in accordance with what Jesus teaches, their faith is dead, lifeless, pointless, useless. He goes on, verse 18. But someone will say, you have faith and I have deeds. James says, show me your faith with, with, without deeds. And I will show you my faith by my deeds. You believe that there's one God good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. You foolish person, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Now, there's one word in this little passage that I think puts everything in perspective. And it's probably not the word you're thinking. It's the word that really puts it in perspective for me is by. I will show you my faith by my deeds. Two-letter word. It's a two-letter word in Greek. But those two letters are so meaningful because what it, what it means by is the origin of action. By. The place where action begins. James says that your faith is the place where action begins. It is the origin of why you do what you do. Your faith should lead to action. James says it's not just about believing in God because even people who reject God believe that He exists. Demons believe that he exists, and they live in fear. They shudder. Literally, that means their hair, the hair is standing up on end. That's the kind of fear that James is talking about. James is saying, if you have faith without, if your faith doesn't cause you to act, then you don't really have any faith at all. Because real faith causes action. And then he offers evidence. He says, okay, let me give you a couple names you probably know. How about Abraham? Abraham had faith, but his faith led him to act. It led him to be willing to to sacrifice his son. He acted on his faith. And that led him to be called righteous. Righteous, righteousness means the fulfilling of the expectations in a relationship. The relationship between Abraham and God, Abraham fulfilled the expectations of that, of that relationship, and so he was called righteous. James says Abraham's faith was made complete by his actions. He became mature. Because he acted on his faith. Rahab. Her faith led her to be willing to help the spies that Joshua sent into Jericho. Her faith led to action. That led her to be called righteous. Meaning she fulfilled the expectations of the relationship between her and God. She grew. Became spiritually mature. Her faith led to action. James closes chapter 2 with a simple statement, verse 26. As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead. Now, in the first century church, there was so much persecution that Christians were kind of skeptical of people when they came, when new believers, they were kind of skeptical, like, ah, maybe he's a spy. I'm just not sure. They were afraid, genuinely afraid. So they often had this trial period where people would 
were, that were new believers, they had to, to prove or demonstrate their faith. And that period could last years. They had to show, right? Their actions had, had to be in line with what they said they believed. I mean, we see that with, with Paul, right? When, when he is converted and the church leaders are like, oh, I don't know if I want him here. He's going to have to... I think the early church founders were from Missouri. Like, they're like, you're going to have to show me. That's, I mean, that's it, right? They needed to know that his faith was real. And the way they would know is because the evidence that they see. Now, I just want to be clear. James is not talking about proving your faith to other believers. James is talking about being counted as righteous fulfilling the expectations of your relationship with God. Your faith is demonstrated by what you do. Now, there's been a lot of thought and writing over the past 2,000 years about differences between James and Paul. And it's caused a lot of confusion. So I, I just... It's something I feel like we need to talk about. I won't spend long here, but, but here's the deal. There are some who would say that Paul is faith only and James is works only. Paul would say, hey, you're saved by grace through faith. In fact, that's what he writes in Ephesians chapter 2, right? He says, for, I, for it is by grace you've been saved through faith, and this is not from yourself. It's the gift of God, not by works. He's specific about that. Not by works so that no one can boast. James says, faith without works is dead. On the surface, that looks pretty far apart in terms of perspective. But they're talking about two different things. Paul's talking about salvation, right? And he's saying, look, there is nothing you can do that will result in your salvation. The only way that you can be saved is by the blood of Christ. That's the only way. So don't fool yourself into thinking that you can work your way up to it to be good enough. I'm pretty sure James would agree with that. I'm pretty sure James would agree with that. Now, the question is, what's the outcome of that salvation? What's the outcome of that faith you've placed in him? Here's what's interesting. The very next verse, Paul says something that sounds a whole lot like James. Ephesians 2.10, for we are God's handiwork. What are we created for? We're created to, to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. You know, the new creation, when they come up out of the water, that new creation was made to do good works. The faith that led them to that point should lead them to do things that build up the body. That's what faith in action looks like. And Paul takes it even a step further. He says, hey, not only are you supposed to do it, but God's already got a plan for what you're going to do. He's got it all worked out. See, James's letter... He, he agrees wholeheartedly with Paul. Faith is what saves you, but your faith better lead you to do things differently. James reminds us, hey, this, this is what's important, y'all. A faithful life looks different. Here's what it should look like. Slow to speak, slow to become angry, quick to listen. Why? Because that's the way Jesus acted. And we love Jesus and we want to live a life that reflects him. We shouldn't show favoritism. Why? Because that's how Jesus acted. And we love Jesus and we want to live a life that reflects him. We should show mercy. Why? Because Jesus showed mercy. And we want to, we we love Jesus. We want to live a life that reflects him. We just want to do what Jesus does. Our life should reflect the love that Jesus poured into us. 
Here's the problem. We live in a, in a world that is consumer-driven. Everything's about us. We are marked by our first world problems. Oh, my fries are cold. Ugh, I hate cold fries. It's terrible. I can't stream with this lousy Wi-Fi. Right? We get, we get really frustrated when things don't meet our expectations. I can't believe I have to wait three days for my package from Amazon. <laughs> really? So we live in this world that conditions us to have everything like we want it. That our desires are king. That our actions should be all about us and about fulfilling our wants and our desires. So it's easy for us even as believers, to sit and hear what, hear what God says to us, pick and choose what we want, and leave the rest behind. But James says, no, no, your faith, your life should look different. You can't be part, you can't dip your toe in the water. You got to be all in. Everything, all in. We have to live a life every day that's consistent with our faith. A life that reflects the character of Jesus. So I want to go back to James 1.25 real quick. Don't worry about putting the slide up. I don't think it's there. But listen to what he says. Whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they've heard but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. We have freedom because Jesus bought it for us. We can do whatever we wish. We can put down our Bibles. We can forget what we read. We can live by the world's standards. We can do all of it. We can come to church on Sunday, put on our smiley happy faces and act, you know, do the whole song and dance that everybody else expects or that we think everybody else expects. We can do that and then act in ways that are totally different for the rest of the week. We can let our wants and desires be first because we're free and Jesus gave us that freedom because we can be forgiven and Jesus gave us that forgiveness. But James says that's not who you were meant to be. That's not who God intends you to be. He wants you to be different. And sometimes we just need to be grounded, right? We need to, we need to return to who we truly are. Reminded of the fact that, that Jesus died for us. Reminded of why we do what we do. James wrote his letter for that purpose, to remind us of what a life of faith should look like. That's also why Jesus instituted this thing that we do every week called communion, the Lord's Supper. It's to remind us of what Jesus has done for us. It's a reminder that he alone saved us. But it's also a reminder that he's not just Savior. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. It's, this is to remind us that just like James, we are to be willing bond servants. We are willing to subject our will to his. Our faith compels us to act. Our faith compels us to act differently. So we're going to sing here in just a minute. I'm going to pray and and, and we're going to have just a little bit of quiet time. I want you to reflect and just think about what Jesus has done for you. And, And when you're ready, take the elements. But I want you to think about things in terms of what's going to happen next week. 
And are you going to live a life that reflects what the Sunday morning crowd thinks you should look like? Or are you going to live differently the next 167 hours of your week? I would just suggest that we live a life that looks like Jesus. Would you pray with me? Father, you are good. Thank you for reminding us every week of who you are and what you've done for us and what that means for who we are. Father, help us to live in a way that reflects the love you have shown us. In Jesus' name, amen.